In the last course, we learned how to empathize with users and define their problems. We used empathy maps, personas, user stories, and user journey maps to identify pain points the user might experience. Our role as UX designers is to understand these pain points and come up with ideas to solve them. Empathy maps, personas, user stories, and user journey maps are tools UX designers commonly use to expand our understanding of the people we're designing for. A lot of planning and detail goes into using these tools, so if you need to refresh your memory, feel free to revisit earlier content. Let's think back to empathy maps. As a reminder, an empathy map is an easily understood chart that explains everything designers have learned about a type of user. Empathy maps help UX designers understand a user's behavior when interacting with a product. To get a little more specific, empathy maps focus on four main motivations of users. What the user says, thinks, does, and feels. In other words, Empathy maps tap into our users' minds and hearts to help us understand their thoughts and feelings in a given situation. The insights gathered from empathy maps allow us to come up with ideas for solutions that address the user's problems and appeal to the user on a deeper level. Next, let's recall personas. As you might remember, Personas are fictional users whose goals and characteristics represent the needs of a larger group of users. As you're ideating, it's a good time to reference the personas you created to help you remember who you're designing for. Ask yourself, are there any specific goals they want to achieve? Or are there any needs that you should design for in order to support the personas? In addition, you might want to review your user stories. A user story is a fictional one-sentence story told from a persona's point of view to inspire and inform design decisions. It introduces the user, lays out an obstacle, and states their ultimate goal. The user story expands on the persona and deepens your understanding of a user group. A good user story can also inspire empathetic design decisions by making our approach user-centered. If you have a lot of user needs to consider, user stories determine which ones are the most critical to resolve. This can help narrow down which user needs to focus on when coming up with ideas for solutions. Lastly, think back to the user journey maps you created. Remember, a user journey is the series of experiences a user has as they interact with your product. User journeys build off their personas and user stories you've already created. User journeys help you come up with ideas for designs that truly support the user's needs and reduce their problems, or what we also like to call pain points. Together, empathy maps, personas, user stories, and user journey maps help us create a problem statement or a clear description of the user's needs that our design should address. Coming up, we'll transition from the problem the user is facing to the solution we can provide as UX designers. So get ready to dig in. Let's work on merging the insights from empathy maps, personas, user stories, and user journey maps to come up with a focus scope for your designs. To focus the scope of your designs, we'll create a goal statement, which is one or two sentences that describe a product and its benefits for the user. In other words, the goal statement provides the ideal solution for the design. So, at this point in the design process, we're transitioning from the problem the user is facing to the solution we can provide as UX designers. The problem is defined in the problem statement and the solution is listed in the goal statement. Goal statements cover who the product will serve, what the product will do, and why the product solves the user's need. To answer the who, what, and why, you should lean on the user research you've already conducted. The easiest way to find out the who, what, and why is to refer back to your problem statement. 
Let's think back to the problem statement formula we introduced earlier. Username is a user characteristics who needs user need because insight. Now, imagine we're designing an app that helps people find and schedule dog walkers. A problem statement we might create would be, Drew is a pet owner in a small town who needs to find and schedule a dog walker because they work the night shift. Now let's connect the dots. Remember, we're transitioning the problem that our user Drew is facing to the solution we want to focus on to meet their needs. The first part of the problem statement, Drew is a pet owner in a small town, describes the user that our design will serve. This informs the who of our goal statement. The second part of the problem statement, find and schedule a dog walker, describes that need or problem that our user Drew is facing. The problem will guide the solution that we need our product to provide, or as we're calling, the what. And the third part of the problem statement, because they work the night shift, describes an insight about our user that might inform our design. In this case, our dog walker app helps people find care for their animals when they're at work or otherwise busy. So how do we actually turn this information into a goal statement? Remember, the goal statement should be just one or two sentences. It needs to describe both the product and its benefits for the user. Our goal statement might be, help users with pets find and schedule dog walkers quickly and easily. If you didn't create a problem statement, fear not. You can also pull the who, what, and why into your goal statement from various other parts of your research and ideation process. For example, the who can come from the persona, the what could come from the user story, and the why can come from the empathy map and user journey maps. Okay, so we've made the transition from the problem the user is facing to the solution we can provide as UX designers. Our solution is outlined in the goal statement. But what will the user experience look like in our solution? Well, up next, we'll create a storyboard which helps us explore a user's experience with a product in order to come up with an ideal flow. See you there. In UX, a storyboard is a series of panels or frames that visually describe and explore a user's experience with a product. Keep in mind, we've made the transition from the problem the user is facing to coming up with ideas for solutions we can provide as UX designers. Think about storyboarding as a tool to visualize potential solutions to problems the user is facing. You might have heard the term storyboarding used in reference to movies or commercials. In those cases, a storyboard gets divided into a set of panels, and each panel tells a piece of the overall story. Well, in UX design, it's similar. Storyboarding is a tool for making a strong visual connection between the insights you uncovered during research and the flow of the experience. Using storyboards to sketch an idea helps you work through the flow of the experience. It can also act as a visual aid to explain your ideas to stakeholders because they can visualize how the product you're designing will be used. A real product might have many screens, but your storyboard should focus on just the most important parts of a user's experience with a product. And as the name suggests, there's a story that should be told through the panels of a storyboard. The four key elements of a storyboard are the character, the scene, the plot, and the narrative. The first element, character, is the user in your story. The next element, the scene, helps us imagine the user's environment. The plot describes the benefit or solution of the design. Finally, the narrative describes the user's need or problem and how the design will solve the problem. Now let's take a look at the template that's often used to sketch a storyboard. This scenario is a short sentence that helps us understand the user and their problem we're solving. 
The visuals guide us through the user's experience with the app or service. This is where you'll actually sketch. And the captions combine the visuals and scenario by describing how the user interacts with the product. Basically, it's the text that describes each frame of the story. Here's a tip. The captions are useful for interactions that may be difficult to sketch out. Let's check out an example of how to take a problem statement and turn it into a six-panel storyboard using the template we just reviewed. Let's revisit a problem statement from course two. Amal is an athlete who needs a way to sign up for workout classes because the class he wants to participate in fills up fast. Our first step is to turn this problem statement into a goal statement. Our goal statement could be help users who are athletes sign up for workout classes early and quickly. Now it's time to storyboard. To save time, I've already built out a six panel storyboard for this example. Let's walk through it together. In the first panel, in the top left of the page, Amal is at the gym and is frustrated because he can't get a spot in today's workout class. In the second panel, Amal is sitting on his couch and opens an app on his phone. Next, in the panel on the top right of the page, I zoom in on the phone and show Amal looking at a calendar and selecting the date he wants to schedule a workout class on. In the fourth panel on the bottom left of the page, Amal selects a workout class. The fifth panel shows Amal on a confirmation screen and tapping a button to confirm his class. In the final panel, I sketched Amal smiling as he attends his workout class. So now you know the basics of storyboards. Next, we'll explore two types of storyboards and when to use each type. See you there. Remember, storyboards are often used to outline movies. In the film world, storyboards are used before a movie is created to show how each scene of the movie will play out for a character. In the UX world, Storyboards are similar. They show how each scene of the journey will play out for a user as they interact with the product. Now, things are about to get interesting. There are actually two types of storyboards. Keeping movies in mind, these two types of storyboards are called big picture and close up. First, let's discuss a big picture storyboard, which focuses on the user experience. Big picture storyboards think about how people will use the product throughout their day and why that product will be useful. This helps you understand the entire user experience, including the different challenges, potential pain points, and types of interactions the user will encounter. Take a moment to think about a movie you watched recently. Maybe it was an action-packed superhero movie or a thoughtful romantic comedy. Each panel of the big picture storyboard captures a part of the character's actions that push the story forward. Again, it's similar in UX design. Each panel of a big picture storyboard captures a part of the user's journey with a product. Let's revisit our dog walking app. Remember, our problem statement was, Drew is a pet owner in a small town who needs to find and schedule a dog walker because they work the night shift. And our goal statement was, help users with pets find and schedule dog walkers easily and quickly. Let's create a storyboard to describe how Drew gets from the problem they're currently facing to the goal when using our product. Remember, we want to include emotion in our big picture storyboard. First, the user leaves their house in the evening, headed to their job as a nurse. Their dog is left at home overnight for 10 hours, so we see the dog with a sad face. Then, as the user is driving to work, they think of their dog at home. The user remembers that they forgot to take their dog for a walk that day. Whoops. Later, while the user is on a break at work, they grab their phone and open the dog walking app. 
the app shows the faces of local dog walkers who are eager to meet the user's pooch. The user feels relieved, knowing that someone might be able to bring their dog for a walk. In the app, there's a clock icon, and the user selects a time for the dog walker to come to their house. There's also a calendar icon to schedule the dog walker on a regular basis. The user clicks the confirm button to finish scheduling. Their dog will be so happy to have some company and go for a walk. Finally, the user returns back to work and is smiling, feeling happy that their dog will be well taken care of and will get more exercise in the future. Notice that this big picture storyboard is focused on how and why. Think about questions like, how will the user use our dog walking app? Why will the app be useful? And why will the user be delighted by the app? Like a good movie, a big picture storyboard can show the emotional engagement that a user will have with our app or with any product. Understanding how a user feels while experiencing your product is an essential part of the design process. All right, so you have the hang of a big picture storyboard. Let's transition to the second type of storyboards, close up. In a close up storyboard, the sketches in each panel focus on the product instead of on the user experiencing that product. While big picture storyboards focus on the how and the why, close up storyboards focus on the what. Think about questions like, what happens on each screen of the product? What does the user do to transition from one screen to another? And after you've created the storyboard, what are potential problems with the flow? Keep in mind, we only need to pick a few key screens to sketch in order to demonstrate the product experience. It's not necessary to do a detailed click-by-click -click play of every part of your product. Let's think about our dog walking app again. In a close-up storyboard, you'll include the same screens that a user will experience. First, the user taps the icon on their phone's home screen to open the dog walking app. Next, the user enters their email address and password to log into the app. The user navigates to the settings page of the app to share the location of their house for the dog walker to visit. Then, the user returns to the home page and taps the clock icon to select a time for the dog walker to come to their house. The user also taps the calendar icon to schedule the dog walker on a regular basis. Finally, the user presses the confirm button to finish scheduling the dog walker. What did you notice about how this close-up storyboard was different from the big picture storyboard? The close-up storyboard is less about emotion since we're not focused on the user. Instead, the close-up storyboard is focused on the practicalities of the design itself. So, how do you decide which type of storyboard to use? To decide, it's helpful to think about the stage of the design process you're in. If you're early in the design process, you might want to present your high-level ideas to stakeholders to get them excited and bought in. In this case, a big picture storyboard makes sense, so your team can focus on the user, their needs, and their experience with your product. On the other hand, a close-up storyboard is more useful after your initial design directions have been explored. Since a close-up storyboard focuses on the details within your product, like screens of an app, this type of storyboard can help you think through practical ideas about improving the product. One more thing. In many cases, you might want to create both a big picture and a close-up storyboard. There are also ways to bring both types of storyboards together. For example, in the storyboard about a mall booking a workout class, we change the focus from the user to their specific interactions within the app. And that's okay. As UX designers, it's good to have a flexible and creative approach to explaining your ideas. So try experimenting with both styles. And that's a wrap. You now know about two types of storyboards, big picture and close up. Keep your storyboards close by.
because later on, we'll use the sketches we created in this close-up storyboard to draw wireframes. Next up, we'll learn the basics of wireframes. Keep up the great work. To kick things off, I'll introduce some common terms that will help describe what we'll work on for the rest of the course. Let's start by explaining what a design is in the context of this program. A design solves a real problem that users are experiencing. And a strong design always puts the user front and center. A design can have different levels of fidelity. In UX, fidelity means how closely a design matches the look and feel of the final product. If a design is low fidelity, that means it has a lower amount of complexity and is less refined or polished. We call low fidelity designs lo-fi for short. UX designers use low fidelity designs when we want to get ideas out quickly and leave room for exploration. If a design is high fidelity, that means it closely matches the look and feel of the final product and is more refined or polished overall. We call high fidelity designs hi-fi for short. UX designers use high fidelity designs when we want to test a design that looks like a real product and get more specific feedback from users. You can think of fidelity like a dial you can turn up or down. For example, imagine you want to quickly draw the rooms of an apartment on a piece of paper with a pencil. You might use simple rectangles and squares to indicate where the rooms are and where the furniture is positioned in each room. That would be a low fidelity design. Or you can dial it up and make a detailed drawing of the apartment, including paint colors and images of pieces of furniture. Your design is now high fidelity because it looks more like the real apartment. In this course, we'll focus on low fidelity designs. We'll cover high fidelity designs in a future course. So let's dive into one kind of low fidelity design, wireframes. A wireframe is a basic outline of a digital experience like an app or a website. As the name suggests, wireframes look like they were created with wires. They're mostly lines and shapes with some text. So why do UX designers create wireframes? Wireframes establish the basic structure of a page before visual considerations like color or images are added. Wireframes serve as an outline to get the team on the same page early in the project. Try using this as your guiding question when creating wireframes. How do I organize information on the page in a way that makes sense for users? Second, wireframes highlight the intended function of the product. When drawing a wireframe, you should think about how the elements serve the overall functionality. For example, the function of a button should be clear and that functionality is expressed through the way that it's drawn. We'll go through this in more detail later on. Finally, wireframes help designers save time and resources. Wireframes allow the team to quickly try out different design options. They also serve as a guide for everyone involved in the project, which saves time later. You can create wireframes by hand or by using digital tools. We usually start creating wireframes by drawing on a piece of paper. We'll start drawing wireframes in the next video, so get ready to try it out. All right, now that you know what wireframes are, it's time to start drawing. We'll introduce the elements that make up wireframes and explain how to draw a wireframe step by step. Later, you'll create your own wireframe. I bet some of you are really excited to put pen to paper. I know I am. But if you're feeling a bit nervous, that's okay too. The good news is you don't need to be an artist to be a successful UX designer. I certainly don't consider myself an artist. In fact, you don't need to have any experience with drawing in order to succeed in this course. Drawing is a learned skill, which means the more you practice, the better you'll get. For some people, 
doodling shapes, lines, and stick figures come naturally. For others, drawing takes more practice. The important thing to keep in mind is that in UX design, drawing is not about creating art to hang on a wall. Instead, a good wireframe is all about organizing and communicating information clearly to your colleagues who will implement your design. You just have to get started and put your ideas on paper. You can do this. One more thing, there are many different ways to draw a wireframe. Some designers prefer messy, hand-drawn wireframes. Others may use rulers and are super meticulous about the way their wireframes look. Do what feels best for you. Okay, so let's start with the basics of drawing wireframes. Your wireframes will be made up of elements. Elements are building blocks for creating a design. Most of the time, you'll use these elements to draw wireframes. Lines, shapes like squares and circles, and text. Take a look at this example of a wireframe. It might look complicated at first, but all I used are lines, basic shapes, and text. Okay, now that you know how to draw each of these elements individually, let's put them together. Think about an app you visited recently, or pull an app up on your phone right now. You'll notice that even the final product is made up of lines, shape, and text. So imagine I want to draw a wireframe that shows an app within a mobile phone. Let me show you an example using these three elements. First, create the frame for the phone. This can be a simple rectangle. Make sure it's large enough to draw inside of. Next, I'll add a bar at the top. This bar is where we display information and actions relating to the current screen. This rectangular bar spans almost the entire width of the app at the top. Below the top bar, add three dividers. Dividers are thin lines that group content in lists and layouts. Now, I'll add some details into each of these two areas. I'll start in the top bar and draw a navigation menu icon. That's the icon on the top left with three horizontal lines. The navigation menu icon should be inside the top bar. Next, I'll add the avatar, which is a big circle with an icon of a person's head and stick figure body. I'll add the avatar in the top right corner inside the top bar. Then, I'll add a circle within each rectangle that was created by the dividers. I'll draw the circles on the left side of the rectangles. I'm trying to keep all the circles the same size, but it's okay if it's a little messy. I want these circles to indicate images, so I'm going to draw an X in each of these circles. Next, add a circle with a plus sign in it, in the bottom right of the frame. Finally, draw horizontal lines to indicate text to the right of each circle. In this example, the line should only be in the middle of the rectangle, not drawn from end to end. Just like that, I have a wireframe. And guess what? It's a wireframe for the Gmail app. Keep in mind, this is just one example of a wireframe, so you can start to visualize this process. The elements you draw in wireframes will vary across different apps and across different screens in an app. To make sure that your wireframes are simple and understandable, we have industry standards. Industry standards are common ways to indicate page elements. In the case of wireframes, there are a few industry standards you should be aware of. You might have noticed these in the wireframe I just drew. The first is text, which should be represented by horizontal lines. Second is images, photos, illustrations, and icons, which are represented by a circle and an X overlapping circle. And third, calls to action are often represented by rectangles or circles. A good example of a call to action is a submit button on a form or the circle to compose a new email in our example. Okay, you know the basics of drawing wireframes and industry standards, and you've seen me draw a wireframe live. It's time for you to get to work. Grab a piece of paper and pen or pencil and meet me in the next video. You're going to draw your first wireframe. An 
easy way to practice drawing wireframes is to recreate an existing app. For this example, we'll draw a wireframe of Google Photos together. First, draw a large rectangle to represent the frame of the phone. We'll leave a short pause to allow you to do this yourself. If you need more time, feel free to pause the video too. Second, draw the top bar, which spans the entire width of the app at the top. Third, draw three rectangles in a row below the top bar. Each rectangle should take up about a third of the frame and have an X inside to indicate their images. Leave a little bit of space between each rectangle. Next, draw the bottom navigation bar, which spans the entire length of the bottom of the frame. Then above the bottom app bar, draw two rows of three squares. When you're done, there should be six identical squares in this section. Now it's time to add some circles and squares to represent all the icons. In the top bar, draw a small rectangle on the far left and a circle on the far right. Next in the bottom navigation bar, add three small squares, one on the left, one in the middle, and one on the right. Finally, add some straight lines to represent where there would be text. First, add a straight line in the middle of the top navigation bar. Then, Add a straight line that goes from the left of the frame to the middle of the frame between the three rectangles and the six rectangles. Last, add a small line below each of the small squares in the bottom navigation bar. Congratulations! You just drew your first wireframe. Are you feeling like a UX designer? You should be. I'm so excited for you. Remember, the more you practice drawing, the better you'll get. So keep up the great work. Congratulations on drawing your first wireframe. I hope you're feeling like a UX designer. Now that you have the hang of things, let's explore wireframes in more detail. Remember, a wireframe is a basic outline of a digital experience like an app or website that's made up of lines and simple shapes. There's almost no wrong time to use a wireframe. Some UX teams might be tempted to skip wireframing because they think it'll save time, but it's a key part of the design process. So, what are some of the benefits to creating wireframes? First, wireframes inform the elements to include in your design. Seeing the elements laid out on a page will help everyone decide if the right elements are included. Second, wireframes help you catch problems early. Wireframes allow you to map out how all the elements will look on each page and how users will navigate from page to page. This lets you check if elements are missing, out of order, or disorganized. Also, wireframes get stakeholders to focus on structure instead of the details like color and text. The magic of a wireframe is its simplicity. A wireframe is a basic outline made up of lines and simple shapes so there are no details for stakeholders to get hung up on. This allows you to make decisions early on the structure of the website or app. Next, wireframes allow you to save time and effort. The wireframe serves as a guide for everyone involved in the project. Engineers and other stakeholders agree to follow the guide early, so fewer revisions are needed. Knowing how the design will be built saves time and effort for everyone. Lastly, wireframes allow you to iterate quickly. When you design, you always need options. Overall, wireframes let us explore a greater number of design ideas and make it easy to create new designs faster. Okay, so now you know the benefits of wireframing. Let's keep building your wireframing skills and check out different methods you can use to actually create these wireframes. See you soon. Congratulations on finishing this course from the Google UX Design Certificate. You can access the full experience, including job search help and start to earn your certificate by clicking on the icon or the link in the description below. Watch the next video in the course by clicking here and subscribe to our channel for more from upcoming Google career certificates.